I'm living there. Someone's like, oh, it's easy for you to travel. You want amazing race. And that when someone's, when someone said this to me, whoever said it, it was, it wasn't like a condescending way, but the way it was told to me, it bothered me. Like I was just like, wait a second. I'm like, I think not money is a set, not having money is a sad excuse for not traveling. Like, it's just not an excuse. Like you can travel on anything. Like, you know, you, there, there's ways to get around this planet, right? If, if you want to, it's once again, it's choice. So when that was said to me, I should find who that person was and, and give them some cash because it paid off because I was so upset that someone thought like, that oh, might have been me. I, think, I think I said that actually. <laughs> <laughs> someone's because someone's when someone said this to me, I was like, Oh man, like they, they think I'm only doing this because I want amazing race. Like that's the only reason why I like to travel. Like I I lived in Brazil. I, I've done all this stuff beforehand. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, I looked and I was like, dude, I'd make it around the world if I had no money. And I remember saying that. And that was the beginning of around the world for free. Well, hello out there in radio slash Spotify slash Apple slash YouTube. We're not on radio. Social. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I mean, maybe we are. Maybe this is like sometime distantly in the future and they're like streaming it through old. Like, Radio's like, is not going to exist in the future. <laughs> Did video kill the radio star? Yeah. Well, anyway. Hi, I'm Benny Goodman and you've just officially been 2020 by myself and my cohort, Corey Peza. That's me. I couldn't even get his name out properly because I... I my brain literally stopped halfway through that. And then my other cohort, and in, 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 I'm not going to say crime. I would say in introspection, because that was what we really had with this episode. Siobhan Cronin. What's up, guys and gals and everyone in between? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> See, when I give Apparently, you guys I just time curb to talk, that. you don't say anything. This is proof. Because I'm always anticipating your next interruption. That's the problem. I have to I have to untrain my brain from expecting you to interrupt my next thought. Have you guys liked and subscribed yet? Yeah, because if not, get on that because this <laughs> upcoming episode is super, super interesting. We have another fantastic guest this week, Alex Boylan, who tells us everything about working a corporate job that he ditched and moved to St. John, got into reality TV, ended up being a producer, like won the all amazing race, 300 grand, moved down to, to the islands to be like Tom Cruise in the, and was it Cocktail or what, what, no, what was the stupid movie? I don't know. <laughs> we don't even, Tom Cruise let him tell the Island. story. The point, the point is, Alex, if there's anyone you've heard on this, on this show, anyone, that has manifested the exact job that they want on their own terms. It's this guy. This guy literally does like his job is 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 the coolest job ever. I'd watch his movie, like the the movie of his life, because <laughs> it's it's insane. Um, I think there's a lot of good like kind of like motivational Write that lessons. Down. Dan Hartwell told me to. Yeah. Okay. Get used to that as well. <laughs> Just jumping off the rails. But yeah, ch check this one out. It's it's really fascinating. Like as far as the story itself is great, but also there's some some pretty good like motivational lessons. If you're feeling like you've been sitting on your ass all year, I think you might you might really enjoy this one. Definitely a good one to listen to. So if you haven't yet, like and subscribe, especially if you like what you hear, go back and listen to all of our other episodes. A lot of great content in there. And once again, we have part one today with Alex Boylan. You've been 2020 would All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of 2020. Great to have you with us. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to go click subscribe, like wherever you follow everything, YouTube, Spotify, doesn't matter how you listen or watch. But stay tuned because we have a great episode coming up today. I'm Siobhan Cronin here with my cohorts, as we've deemed ourselves, Benny Goodman. What's going on, Siobhan? <laughs> hey, and Corey Peza. Cheers. And today we have a super exciting guest that I'm, I'm really excited to dig into your whole history and everything. Um, I don't know how you want to be categorized, but you kind of gone across the scope of all different jobs. Former reality TV star, producer, creator. Today we have Alex Boylan with us. Thank you for being Ooh. here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Alex in the great, house. Great to be here. Thank you for doing the right thing, Alex. I appreciate it. Anytime. Anytime. Good to be here. So, Alex, you were just in Mexico, right? I, I was. So can like you tell us about ago. what you were doing there just to like dive right oh, in? Oh yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I just, I just launched this new show with Amazon. I have a couple different shows going on right now, but this one is like on the sickest villas on the planet. It's called oh, Epic so Villas. Jealous. And uh, each episode we showcase the five, you know, best villas of, a, of an area. So we were Sounds in Mexico, which is about 
It's a hard job. It's really tough. <laughs> um, and it's, more, it's uh, yeah, it's about 45 minutes north of Puerto Vallarta. So I was down there more like for promotion and, and kind of like launching the whole thing with them. But uh, we were filming there, I don't know, probably like four or five months ago. But yeah, so I was down there just kind of having fun, to be honest with you. Wow. You know? What's it what's it like in Mexico right now or this year it's, in general? Uh, it's not, I mean, definitely I'm coming from LA, right? Even though right now I'm, I'm you know, at my parents' house in, in Georgetown, Massachusetts, I'm, uh, I, I'm based out of LA. So LA has been, I don't know, it's not as bad as the news says it, but like restaurants and all that kind of stuff shut down. So in Mexico, it was fun to actually go to a restaurant, how, like to how go are they, actually how are out they, to a bar. Yeah. How's the actual, the populace? Uh, is there any sort of masks or is it just kind of yeah uh, no no definitely I, I would say it's definitely not like it is here in the states and and you know every some weird ta tan lines down there weird tan lines man but you know what's interesting i mean our whole country is such a tapestry right like you go down to florida where I'm, i'll be there next week and there you know go to the north florida right now and where like, shivon is oh yeah yeah i'm from oh, miami oh, okay yeah and and like well miami's i, I felt like down south florida is a little bit more like you know, protective, but like go up to Jacksonville. They're like COVID. What? Like, and then, yeah. In LA, well, North Florida like, really... in general is like a different country from yeah. South Florida. Hundred percent, right? <laughs> I went to school at Jackson University, so I know Florida pretty well. Um, anyway, so yeah, it was people were out and about. Like restaurants were open, but they were they were like the restaurants and bars are supposed to shut down at eight or nine. But I'd say that's more of a suggestion because one <laughs> night everyone was like, oh, we got to like get in because the restaurant's going to close at nine. And we're just like walking through this right outside of Punta de Punta Mita is a little town called Punta de Mita. And uh, I just started talking to this guy and it was his restaurant. He's like, no one's telling me to shut down. We're open. So we, we went in there like <laughs> drank till one o'clock in the morning. So, uh, you know, so it's a, it's a little, it's, it's Mexico. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think Latin culture in general is just kind of like the Miami's the same. It's like, oh, what bedtime? We're just going to do what we want as late as we want and drive however we want. Does not matter. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh yeah. So it was, it was, it was awesome. It's like for, uh, for me coming, it was, it was just, you know, Punta Mita, Punta Mita itself, because Punta Mita is like a 15,000 acre private gated area, right? And it's just, it's it's a pretty spectacular place. And the only way to get in there is if you're staying in one of the villas or, or one of the hotels. Inside there- One of the five best villas. Only the five best for you, right? Yeah. Is it, is it, now, is it still villa down there or is it via? I was calling it Villa, but maybe people were making fun of me. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know because it's 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 the double L. So I I, I just I'm trying to be cultured. I know you're like one of the most cultured people I know. <laughs> yeah, but like, I, but I, but you know, I'm from Georgetown, Massachusetts, so my grammar is all over the map. So uh, who knows? Oh. <laughs> so anyway, you say, yeah, so you say so it was So inside, when you're inside those gates, it was like really like pretty 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 loose. You know. So yeah. What did it take to get into the country? I'm just asking because I was actually in Nassau in the Bahamas and it was like a whole process. You had to take a COVID test to le to get into the country, then another rapid one when you got in. And it was like, you can't just tell me you're a rock star. Like, no. you, like, that's what I tell people when I try to get backstage. <laughs> No, but it's, it's similar, you know, one of those like resorts where it's mostly out of towners and, you know, you're within like the walls of the resort. You're not really like in the actual city, you know, you're just like in a private place on the beach. Was it hard? Like, what did they expect you to do to like get into the country? Was it difficult? They were like, you know, buen bonitas, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> it was like no problem whatsoever. Yeah, I got oh, in there, rented a car and I was on my way driving north. So what about going yeah. back? Yeah. It, oh, so. Because I think they, no, first, I think this is more of a suggestion too. And it's interesting as a couple of international shows I have, because, so I don't know. I got out of there before technically, mm. you know, there's supposed to be these, you know, new rules setting into place. And that, I think that's starting like now. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. I got out like two days before that was, that was happening. But I, I don't know. I think the worst case scenario they're going to do is like show a negative COVID test. Right. And nowadays you can get those everywhere. So yeah. I'm hoping, you know, I, I think uh, my personal opinion, not to get down this path, but I think it's a, there's a lot of talk, you know what I mean? But when you actually, if you need to get somewhere for something, I feel like no one, I've been filming during this whole time. Mm -hmm. Like I've been doing, we're in a small, we're a small cruise, right? And obviously we're, we're taking all the precautions to make sure we're good, but, and, and we're all getting tested all the time, but I haven't been, a, I haven't had a problem going places. That's, that's yeah. great. Um, so I know, I think we definitely want to dive into like kind of the projects you're working on now, but before we get too far in for people that may not know you, um, can you give us a little bit of your, your background? Like, uh, you started off on, on the amazing race, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I was, I was an international business major working the most boring job as a market analyst before I quit that and moved, uh, to St. John in the islands in the Caribbean. 
Yeah, so I was I was about a year out of school and I was like, this is no business school. That this sucks. So like this this whole job. So I quit and that was the first that that summer was when the first season of Survivor came out. And it was the first time I ever watched television. I was like, oh my gosh, I was glued to like every episode. I was like, this is so cool. And um I I had a due date of when I had to leave St. John because I dropped my car off at my buddy who was going to Clemson. And this is one of my best friends I grew up with here in, here in Massachusetts. And I said, I'll be back for your graduation. So I had this due date. So I came back, picked up my car, went to his graduation. We both came back here to, uh, to Boston. And uh, this pop-up came on my computer. I was like, race around the world. And I've been very fortunate. I've lived in Germany and lived in Brazil. And, you know, I was like, this sounds awesome. So we applied got on the show, friggin' won the show. And, you know, it was a complete, like the best left turn, you know, you can have in your career because I, I always say it was always, I'm a competitive guy. I wanted to win the show, but truly being part of the production, right? Like that was the first time I was exposed to this world. So all of a sudden here is a kid who's like quit his corporate job, thought he was being bred to be in this place that I hated. And now I'm, I'm like racing around the world, but I couldn't stop talking to the producers. And back in those days, they did not want you to talk. They're like, stop talking to the producers. You're not supposed to have a relationship with these people. And I was like, wait a second, this is your job? This is what you do? <laughs> you can do money man? for this? Yeah, I was like, this is what you guys, so I had no idea. And, I, and I, I'm telling you, it was like day one on that show. I was like, oh, I'm doing travel shows. I didn't know that was a thing. And that was, <laughs> yeah. And so that was the beginning. And, and wow. you know, wow. obviously, you know, the, the career goes in, in many different ways, but I had, I had a, a couple really nice breaks. Um, there, so wait, a mi well, a million dollars on television is not a bad first start. Not a bad first start. You know? first, people don't know remember, that, I didn't know that. I had to look it up and go watch some of the stuff because I'm so old and such a Luddite. Like the last show <laughs> I, I watched was like Leave it to Beaver. And then it was 90 Day Fiance. And there's nothing Danny, in between. You're like young. What are you talking about? I know. I'm you old. like act have way older. Have you seen like the scans of my back? I have arthritis of like a 60 year old. Trust oh me, Oh my bro. gosh. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So yeah. Nice chunk of change for being 23 years old. It, you know, Yes, they say you want a million dollars. Everyone thinks that. I split that with Chris and then taxes. So, yeah. So, made $23. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, Bitcoin. So you, one you, Bitcoin. You, you, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, it was it was a nice 300 grand to kind of start life off. So, not not a bad way, you know, to, not a bad check at the age of 23. But the most important thing, like I say, it, it was the fact that I'm, now I found my passion. Like, truly, I found my passion on that show. You mean show. watching other people be tortured on television for money and then going to really nice places but not having to be the one that jumps off the cliff? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess, yeah. It's like, it's like tell yeah. Bear Grylls to go up Mount Everest. We'll watch him from the helicopter. Fuck all y'all. I've no, already I, done honestly, this. I want a million like, dollars. Fuck well, we'll, those clowns. We'll, we'll, get it, we'll get into this, but it's funny. It's like some of, I miss, like there's a show I did called Around the World for free. I miss that type of like grit. You know, I think we I just had Jeff on, by the way. He was oh, our, did you? Uh, yeah. one of our oh, last yeah. episodes, Jeff Schroeder. Yeah, Jeff's my boy. You know, I love Jeff. Yeah, he was in my wedding. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, there, so anyway, there's, yes, you kind of start evolving and you to do different things and bigger things. That, but at the end of the day, like travel, grit type of travel and, and, and seeing like the most far off the grid places is who I am as a person. Like that like brings me the most joy of any shows that I do. That's amazing. What was it about uh, production that, you know, you, you said you kept, you kept talking to the producers. What was it specifically about that aspect that, that kind of pulled you in that direction? <laughs> A great question i just thought the whole thing was so cool like it was you know imagine you're like flying around on planes going to these awesome locations it's like this organized chaos but with a with a very like team mentality yeah. right and so and and i think it was just that energy that like it, that i drew to it and as i've gone on in my career you guys know it very well as being a band right like we're very blessed to be in a business where i can show what i did Right. Like when I go back to like my first job or my only job in the corporate world, I didn't, no one ever saw what I did. Oh yeah. yeah I just did all these awesome spreadsheets and like, you know, <laughs> gave all the salespeople their numbers of the week, whatever it yeah. was. I get to be like, Hey, watch around the world for free. Watch eco challenge, watch Epic Village. It doesn't matter what it is. It's like, I worked on that. Like I made that, you know? And so I think that's, what's really cool about being an artist. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, the team mentality. Uh, you, you also mentioned you were in Brazil. That was with, that was for soccer, correct? Yeah. So you totally. so that so you were you have a background it wasn't, wait, in organized it wasn't for sports. like the wandering spiders out, down there because that's why Corey's wife was in was in Brazil. Not only was she well, born she, there, no, she was she born loved, there. That's why she, she was there. She loves the spiders. <laughs> uh, it's all about the arachnids. You convolute everything. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just don't pay attention to the details. Right. 
point being, uh, <laughs> so, so you have this background in organized sports, um, and that's kind of something we've seen. We've, we've spoken with Jeff, and we actually spoke with uh, Pauly Calafiore, another um, person with a reality TV background who also came from organized sports. Do you think there's something... And going to the Olympics, about Corey, that? don't yeah, forget and, that. And, and a hopeful, uh, an Olympian hopeful. Um, but is there something about that organized sport team athleticism, do you think kind of drives people into that area of, of competitiveness for the show itself? And then, you know, that, that world of exploration afterwards. You know, it's funny. I've never, it's a great question. I don't know if I've ever actually put that comparison together. I'm just thinking through friends, yeah. right. That I know in the business. And I think a lot of them were athletes, right? So I, I do think that there's something to like, you know, or like we're, we're part of this, we have this mission, right. And no mission is the exact same. And right. every single mission you go on is going to have all these variables chucked on you that's going to derail you from your mission, right? And so 100%, I mean, down to like Chris Lugo, who I won the amazing race with. I mean, he was a, he was a, you know, he played rugby at Clemson and we played sports all growing up and I always contribute part of our success besides being good friends. So wait, was, you, you were the guy beating us up in high school. No way. I was the nice guy, man. <laughs> I was, I Megan, was super my girlfriend nice. when I broke up with her for, you know, going, cheating on her, playing Metallica with that other chick. <laughs> well, I can't, you know, I don't know. What was your girlfriend? Wrote her saying? a poem or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, so I think it's a, it's a great, a great correlation, right? Absolutely. That, it, that there's something to, you know, and there's something, it's, it, how fun is that? You know, it's, it's right. like, you know, there's not, there's nothing more fun than going. And I actually thrive you know, I've worked on tiny shows, which are most of the shows I, I prefer to work on is like five, six person crews, you know, and then there's the eco challenges. That's a thousand people in the field. There's Steve Harvey show where it's like 400 people. But on why would you prefer day. the smaller um, uh, crews? Um, why, what, I feel the like the, the, everything's different, right? Benny, it's hard to like every scenario and every show is different. So it's hard to like, you have to take them piece by piece. But in general, A, it's just what I'm good at because around the world for free, and, and sorry if I'm diving all over the place here, but like I had to make that show with one person. This guy named Jolt Luca, right? The first season. I love Jolt. Jolt's he's the man. The best. You first off, his Jolt name is spelled Z, Z S O L T. So first off, he's got the coolest name, <laughs> Jolt. He's cool. like an interjection. <laughs> like yeah. I jolted you. Yeah. And and he's 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 like he's from Transylvania, Romania. He's from Transylvania. Wow. He's got the coolest yeah. accent. He's like yeah. the most incredible director, most philosophical. Yeah, the dude totally. doesn't sleep. He's like literally <laughs> if he were a crystal meth addict, but didn't do crystal meth, but got that much done. That's yeah. Joel. He'll, he'll get by in the field with some Kit Kats and Cokes until he like you know croaks <laughs> <Done>. over. <laughs> but like. Wow. Yeah, and, and, and I got plenty of stories like that. But so, so imagine the first show, and and I we've made a pretty big jump here from Amazing Race to Around the World for Free because there's ten years there that I was like doing shows. But like when I had come up with this concept for the show, the only way for this to work, the whole idea is one person has to make it around the world using the help of the online community, right? So you're basically couch surfing your way around the planet mm -hmm. and fully interactive, real time show. So the only way to pull this off is to keep that crew like super tight. So when Jolt and I launched that, I mean, we, we didn't even know if it was this whole, we got CBS on board, all this stuff to happen. We didn't even know if the show was going to work and it did. But the fact that like, you know, the fact that Jolt and I had had to figure out, there's no Facebook. It was the first online interactive show ever. No Facebook. Mm -hmm. Well, YouTube Jeff was, was telling just us that he was like literally the only barrier between the total creep shows getting him on a plane. And like, I mean, this was like, like yeah. you know, Craig's with, Craigslist casual encounters times. <laughs> like this was yeah. age sex location times going like, hey, by the way, can you fly me to Japan? Like you guys were doing this before. I mean, everything now is instant gratification. We have a whole, yeah. uh, we have a whole network of people. It's like, we oh yeah. access that, to, to scoping people That out. person's I mean, three meters away from me in Barcelona. You can meet people so easily. This was like oh, yeah. at a time where it was like courageous to follow the internet. Yeah. I mean, we could do like hours upon hours of the production of just two people having to go around the world and pull this show off and deliver content and go live to CBS. But we did, right? And we yeah. and Joel and I loved it. And, it. and it goes, so I prefer to work with people that can wear three hats. They're experts maybe in one thing, but are like, you know, be in two other categories. I'd rather that because now there's just the access to people and places and stories with that. Like every time you add a person to a crew, it slows it down. Right. There's just no, uh, you know, too many just, cooks so, in the kitchen. 
Yeah, it just, it's just hard to move, right? It's just hard when you got like a, when you got even ten people. I got to move ten people from here to here, or wherever it mm-hmm. is, right? It's like herding cats, fifty, a hundred. Well, plus exactly. the bureaucracy. I mean, it's similar in the music industry. You think about smaller crews and bands versus these giant arena shows. I mean, it's like you have one question and you have to find yeah. fifty people. And then you introduce that a union question. to that, right? Equation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just gets exponentially worse. <laughs> yeah. So I th- so I personally thrive in the give, give me like four badasses. You know what I mean? And I'll make a great show. That's amazing. Well, yeah. let's go back for a second before you go on from there. You did something really bold, which was quitting a job that was cushy, you know, and something that probably would have stuck with you for the rest of your life. Um, was there a particular reason that you did other than, you know, realizing that you didn't like it? Um, I mean, that was pretty bold to just quit and move somewhere else. Did you have something in this other place that was inviting you there or was it just kind of like, I'm getting out and I'm going to figure it out from there? Yeah. Great question. So, um, it's a couple of, like a string of events, right. That, that led me to like peace out on that job. A, it was a, I'd worked for this guy in Germany, right. He's a family friend, ridiculous amounts of money for my age. Like for, for the job that I had was like really impressive coming out of college. He had told me, I had to like look him in the eyes, like, you got to give me minimum two years. He tells me this. Is there an opening, you think? <laughs> Can you still call that guy? <laughs> maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. And so, I, you know, I take the job and I'm miserable. Like, I mean, I remember day two. I'm just like, this is oh. my life. Like, I'm behind the, I'm behind crunching numbers. I'm like, I can remember being trained, being like, you just got to make the graphs, like the you color coordinate. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so boring. <laughs> so I wanted out day one, but I just couldn't do it. There could not, just too many like <laughs> strings attached. So I, the best thing that happened, it got me out of there just quicker than what I would have gotten out before. So the junior year that I worked for, uh, my junior year of college, I worked for this guy in Munich, Germany, right? So I, and I was on a, I played, played soccer at Jackson University. So I had technically this year left of eligibility that I never played. And for division one, you have five academic years to play four years of athletics. I still graduated in four years. So even though I had this year off in the corporate world, technically I still had this fifth year of academics, if it makes sense, mm-hmm. to play that fourth year of sports, right? Mm-hmm. The year after I graduated, our, our program was very, very dirty and got busted on a lot of recruiting violations and, and the whole program went down. So they lost all their recruits. So they're just trying to put a team together. We, and they, so they're like, oh, Alex has a year of eligibility left. So I just get a phone call, the blue. Hey, Alex, how about we pay for your MBA? Come back and play a season. Like the best gift on earth, yeah. right? And so I was like, oh, this is great. And, and for me, it wasn't about anything. It was just out of this job. So I, that, so I was just like, oh, this, who's going to complain that I'm going to free Hold ride? On. I mean, most people, like, they have to go do other things that kind of suck. You're like, let's go back and play the football <laughs> yeah, and, no. and get it higher your education. You're like, bro, I yeah, bet very- you those chicks are hot over there. These German girls are not my speed. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I, I go down to Florida, right? I go back to Florida to go, to go play this and like day two, it's a technicality, right? Technically it's from the day you start. So anyway, NCAA comes out, I'm about a week into practice and they're like, dude, you're ineligible. And they, so that I lose my ride. I get in this whole argument with the president, the athletic director. I'm like, you guys are still paying for this. So everything was just not working out for that decision. I just yeah. quit the job, moved down wow. to Florida, yeah, lost my massive. ride. So it's like all this bad stuff was happening. And I just sat back. I always loved the movie cocktail with Tom Cruise. Like, I just love that movie. And so I've always kind of dreamed of moving down to the Caribbean. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. <laughs> and so I literally just like drove from Jacksonville, Florida to Clemson. <laughs> I went to my boy Luke's house. I was like, Luke's I'll see you for graduation. Peace out. One way ticket down to St. John. That was it. Wow. Yeah. Good for you. That's incredible. I mean, that like so few people, I think, have the guts to do something like that. So you tell us about. You literally rode to the end of the world and yeah. then just kept going and yeah, until you it. found like an island and then you like you you took on the Tom Cruise thing and said, uh, "I'm going to make some." Uh, I got the tan. I, I could ri- I could write. A, I always about thought about like writing a book about that first day because I literally had a backpack, right? maybe like 500 bucks to my name. Right. And to get to St. John's, I mean, it's not easy. You got to get to St. Thomas. You got to cross the Island, get to Red Hook, get onto a ferry. And I remember just walking onto this Island that I'd heard about that was supposed to be super cool. And you can make a bunch of money bartending and be like, Oh man, this is like my home. And like found a little, like, you know, hotel to stay in. And the first bar I saw, I can remember it's called Woody's. I got some, it's around August. So their season hasn't really picked up yet. So it's early for the Caribbean. 
And it just said like best happy hour in the Caribbean. So I remember walking in there and I had like my resumes printed out and I walked in these two guys like working in the bar. I'm like, Hey, listen, you guys hiring any bartenders? They're like, yeah, like maybe I have, I'm like, here's my resume. And they're kind of like, uh, okay. And I'm like, show, up. They're like, yeah, they're like, show up tomorrow. And that was like it. I had a job the next day and just like, yeah, it was awesome. It's great. Wow. You know what? This, this, this is a, this is a horrible example you're setting though, because you haven't failed at anything. You go on reality TV, you go on the first show, you win, you get the, the job in well, Germany, you go over there, you make so much money. They're like, fuck it. Come back to, to, to do soccer. They're like, oh, we, we can't afford to pay for you. You think you failed, but instead no, you end up in St. Parks he, he with a job said, in ben. 27 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, but he could he could have said no along the line to all those things. And the fact that he said yes, even though it didn't work out right away, is what's important here. I 100 percent agree. And I think that there's a um, I think it's like we all know we're in the flow. Right. And like when you when and when things are working in the flow, I think it's hard to get there. There's plenty of times in my life I'm not there. But those are the moments like for me, I'm I'm a, I have a wanderlust spirit. And when I own that and I live to that and sometimes it's very easy to get off track and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I better go make this show and I better go make this money and better do this over here. Things don't work out. But when I kind of like for whatever reason, at least in my life, and I'm like, I do it out of a out of passion because I love it. It works out. And I think a little bit that's just sheer mentality, right? That you're, it's like, what is working out or not working out, right? It's like, I'm, I'm coming here. That's something that we've heard once again, time and time again on this show is J John Garabedian. He said he just follows what he loves. And that, like we asked him to say, well, what, what inspired that decision? He's like, that's what I wanted to do. And it's and like that led to a super successful career. I think we've, we've heard that multiple times. So you're, you're well, kind like of even just David Abrazis from Pearl Jam was like, all I'm going to do is play drums. And then, like, that's literally all he's ever done. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't always work out that great for other people. No, <laughs> not for everybody. But, like, but even, like, someone like Richard Shaw, he's like, I'm going to learn how to play music, so I'm always ready. And then the next thing you know, he's, like, lives down the street from a guy in the band Cradle of Filth, and he goes from playing Stephen Sondheim productions yeah. to being in the band Cradle of Filth. But the most you know important I mean? part of that story is the fact that he got a call and he was willing to take the chance on that without, you know, considering, oh, well, maybe I don't have the time to, you know, it won't work out. So just kind of yeah. answering that call figuratively and literally, um, I think is, is kind of the gist of that, but that's amazing. And that how many, and I think it's hard, Corey, you know, I think it's hard to do. I think it's easier said it's easier. Sure. Cool. I'm like, Absolutely. you know, I'm 43 now. And like, I kind of know who I am. It's taken me probably to 40 to get to figure out who I am mm -hmm. and when I'm good at, but if you ask me this question at 35 or 28, there's like ups and downs, you're crazy. It's like, but it's true. It's, 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 it's hard to make those decisions. Do you think it gets like, harder as you as you age as well because you start uh, to get a little more solidified into a certain lifestyle? Pending the decisions you make, for sure, yeah. right? Like, you know, I don't have kids, you know, I don't have like there's a lot of things I've sacrificed in my life because, you know, I, I am in Because you want to like be this. in Mexico at the five best villas instead <laughs> exactly. of like, instead like, some I, crying I want, baby shitting I, on your face. I want like an endless <laughs> summer, like life. And but there's a sacrifice that doesn't come for free. Right. Like there's sure. sacrifices you're going to make, you know, in order to have that. I have a lot of friends that are, you know, have awesome lives, but I, I'm not, that's not my jam. Right. I hope I you're wearing sunblock. <laughs> I, I know. What? <laughs> I said, I hope he's wearing sunblock. It sounds to me like he's that. on the Look beach a lot. And I hope you're drinking a lot of fluids that don't have alcohol in them. Because you want to know what? Like, I worry about my friends that have cirrhosis. I worry about my friends that are getting melanoma. Because you know what, man? I love Mexico. I love Why the beach. Why are you putting I that bad juju yeah. on yeah. No, no. Well, first off, there's my, the other Jew that's part of the juju is my brother. So that's the juju. Okay. No, I'm just saying I'm being the Jewish mother. It's not bad juju. It's saying protect yourself. Because the good things can come to an end if you don't prepare okay well i appreciate it man i'm <laughs> hydrating right now yeah I and i think I can you can probably do without you. the sunscreen while you're sitting there i don't know if you're getting the snow but i'm getting the snow right now oh i know it's so awesome yeah. <laughs> it's like six thousand k <laughs> well so let's pick up from there so you land on it in st john this is your new home you get a, a job the next day so what happened after that what was the trajectory uh well i, I mean i literally was like like well, I mean, I had fun for a year, just a lot of fun <laughs> yeah. for a year. Okay. Right? I mean, I'm, I, I remember it's like, I, and I, I got to tell you the other best lesson I learned from this. And I say this all the time, my, that the decision to go to St. John was kind of like a rock bottom decision. I quit mm -hmm. a job. I lost my right. Things weren't working out. And then I, I remember being in this like you like euphoric state of being like I, the toughest decision I had to make in the morning was like, do I go diving over here or go hike that cliff? Like it was like the best like days in the world. And so I say it to this day. It's like 
if all fails, <coughs> it's like, I feel like I have like the best safety net in the world. If it doesn't yeah. work out for me tomorrow, I will pack my bags. I'll go bartend and I'll have a great life. Right. That's, and like, so that's my bottom. Right. That, that's, I, I won't do that, that in a, I won't go, be, <laughs> I won't be grinding it out in some boring job. No, I'll be like, thrive. I don't need to make money or not. I really don't care about that. As long as I'm having an awesome life. I, another, another thing I, I forgot to leave out of this story. Right. So I'm in the corporate world making really what I would think really good money is all these things. And I remember, and I'm young, I'm, I'm like 21 or 22. Right. And I remember having like $3,000 in debt on a credit card and thinking like, Oh my gosh, like the dad was like, how do I have all this? But for, so for that age, I remember feeling like, Oh my gosh, I'm like, and I'm obviously outspending my lifestyle living here was outspending what I'm making. Right. Two months of being in the crib, I remember having fifteen thousand dollars in my bank account. I was like, "Oh my gosh, how funny is this? I live in board shorts. I'm having a blast. I work four hours a day, and I have way more money than like grinding it out in this office." So it's true. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah it's funny. <laughs> Wow, that's, that's not so funny. That's inspiring. I literally think I'm going to go and just like sell all of my guitars, just go down to St. Bart's, start drinking again because I don't drink anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then, so I, well, I have to taste test the drinks to make sure that they're good for the, for the customers. But isn't but it strange? That, isn't it strange to think that there really amazing. is that you can make a ton of money doing something you love in an amazing place, but 300 million people think of that as like a, a fantasy. Totally. And like yeah, not, I, even, not even like a, an option. Yeah, there's a lot of options out there, a lot of risks to take along with it, you know, and, and decisions you've made along the way that can make these decisions easier. And I always try to say, sure. I'm very grateful and very, very humble there, I guess to say in my life, like I'm very appreciative of, of the journey that I'm on and the journey. And I work hard to keep that journey going. But I always say when people like complain, I don't like complainers at all, but it's like, how many billion people would like trade places with you in a heartbeat? Any of us, yeah. right? And so it's like, you got to keep that in the back of your mind, you know, and you're it's like we are we are it, all are very blessed just to be in this country and do what we're doing spend a sure. Saturday. i trade with siobhan <laughs> <laughs> no but i i relate to this a lot because you do have to make a lot of hard choices both big and small along the way and i this brings up a question that i want to ask you um did you feel any pressure not necessarily growing up but just throughout your time as a student or in college to go that corporate route or to have that sort of you know square life for lack of better term where you know you're making a certain salary and working in an office was that something that you felt pressure to do yeah it, actually no i because my, my dad's a pastor i grew up i wasn't going to disney world i was like feeding the poor in like istanbul turkey as a kid so i, I got a global wow. view of the world inside so a very unique upbringing like traveling the globe and and kind of like in mexico we no. brief, just so you know we briefly met your father because Corey and i we're in Wish for Christmas. Oh yeah, with nice. the band. We'll, we'll, we're, 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 we'll come back to that, but oh we'll come God, back to that. Awesome. But just so you know, your okay. father was there, and I was like, I, when I first saw your father, and and I know your sister, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it all makes sense now. It's awesome because you like you definitely look like you stole a little bit from here, and then like that's him, and your dad has a very like orator esque yeah, voice. Yeah. It's funny that it's funny that my whole not to go down to attention, but like my brothers and sisters, we all turned into storytellers because we listened to a dad, you know, tell stories. Yeah, all the sure, time. So, yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, I walked in the room and didn't know who your father was, but I knew who your father was just by his voice. Oh, that's awesome. That's cool. That's cool. He's a pretty amazing man. But yeah, wow. that that worldly view definitely seems to have inspired uh, some of the some of the decisions you've made for sure. Yeah, I definitely. I I think. Um, it's okay going all over the map, right? Well, so what? one of the, the, my parents, so my dad, every seven years, he got uh, six months off to do a sabbatical, right? And so there was a point where I'm one of four kids that my older sister was going off to college a couple years later than my brother, than me. It was like the last year that we were all going to be in one like home, like together. And my parents, I didn't have any money growing up. Like, you know what I mean? I think never had a new shirt. Like it was always a hand out from my brother. So that was the type of, but we, we did get to see the world, but my parents took all four of us, right? We landed in Izmir, Turkey, and we backpacked through like Greece and Southern Europe and ended up in Scotland for like three months, like all on like buses and sitting on sides of highways. And so Jeez. I, and I'll never, and I was around 14. And so I think of all my brothers and sisters, I probably was influenced the most because yeah. of my age, like my older brother and sister, yes, it was cool, but they had like 
boyfriends and girlfriends and like, oh my gosh, I'm only back in high school. My little sister's pretty young. I'm reading at that one. Like my parents are still cool. I don't have to go to school. This is awesome. Right. <laughs> like I was loving every second of it. Right. And so I, I can remember, I still can remember like landing in Turkey in like the nineties, you know what I mean? Like where are we? And just like, it was, and I was so mesmerized with the way my father just knew how to like navigate the world. Right. He would just like, we were always, we were doing Airbnb before we didn't have money to stay in hotels. He'd be like, oh, I know some over here. We're going to stay. So we were always talking about around the world for free. We were always living with locals, like and living, you know, and so it was an influential trip that I, I, I always trace a lot of my journey back to that one trip. Wow. That's incredible. Sounds yeah. like he it's instilled cool like a lot of capacities that you've now used for your life because mm -hmm. I mean, I, my father, I, I felt the same way. Like he could like look at a map and get anywhere in the country or in the world. And, and he, he was a pilot. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. Like I don't have a confidence that I can get to the Dunkin' Donuts across the street by myself <laughs> without holding an adult's hand. Whereas like your dad just like, Oh, I'll find somebody in Turkey and like, yeah. we'll stay on his like, uh, in the back room with the chickens. And you then part, Parlay that into going on the show where you have to use your your wits and your abilities and obviously your muchismo and intelligence and culture um, to get around the world. You win a million dollars and you're like, but still, that's not enough for for Alex. Let's let's talk to the producers. I want to do this all the time. By the way, I still have a gig back in St. Bart's where I could be making a crap ton of money. And let me tell you, it goes a lot further than Germany. Have I caught yeah. up so far, Alex? You're pretty spot on, my man. Okay. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> that's a loaded question. There's probably a lot next. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> Is there hidden? Well, there's well, there's a chronology. It seems. It's okay. Like, yeah. So all right. So all right. So where where are we at? So St. John finished that thing. Then I mean, literally, I come, I pick up Luke, Chris, Luca. This is the guy going on amazing race with. Go to his graduation. We drive back to Boston. He's like a double chemist, super smart guy, like engineering. So he's all gung ho on like, let's go. I can't wait to get a corporate job and all this stuff. And I'm sitting back here being like, there's no way I'm going back to that world. Like, there's no way I'm going. So we're kind of like in this like crossroads. And literally the only thing on television that time was that first season of Survivor pop up, like literally on my computer is like race around the world for a million dollars. And I was like, oh my gosh, this thing looks awesome. And I mean, I'm literally, we did the casting video in the house I'm at right now. My wow. little sister, it was summertime. My little sister grabbed like an old VHS camcorder. We walked outside. It was like pitch black. It's kind of funny because when the casting field, and like she just like put it up and Chris and I just started talking. And then we <laughs> FedExed that thing away. Never thought about it. You know what I mean? Not thinking like, anything's going to happen. We just did it for fun. FedEx it, mailed it. And uh, we were very lucky. We got very fortunate to get over to Europe. This someone, someone's father gave us these tickets to go to Europe. So we're backpacking around Europe. My parents have to be in this how this little like chalet in Switz in like yeah Switzerland. And I, I we rolled in there for one night. This is before cell phones, any of this stuff. We roll into this house. We're having like cheese fondue with my mom, and um, all of a sudden the, the phone rings. My mom's like, I've never heard the phone ring here. <laughs> never heard the phone ring, and it's CVS had tracked us down. <gasps> they go, we want to meet you guys. And so, and we were about to be in like the next day or the day is after. Is that proof of, hold on, let me stop you there. Is that proof of concept that they had to like find you in a, was it a chalet, a parlay? <laughs> That's a, incredible. A fallet, yeah. eating fondue with <laughs> yeah. your mom in <laughs> Switzerland. Yeah. And they're like, oh dude, this, these guys are fucking banana land. Like they, we can't even find these fuckers. <laughs> what was yeah. on the audition tape? What, 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 what do you oh, think? So like they, you know, it's funny when they brought us in, cause back in those days, casting was a different process. There's many layers. First meet in Boston, then you go to New York and eventually you go to LA to, you know, so many, many layers, like two month process. Um, but they were joking because when they, cause they brought us in, they're like, we literally could not see you guys on your tape. Like you guys might want to put a light <laughs> on you. We chose you guys for this first interview because we just liked the way you guys were rapping together. You know what I mean? Just talking back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of went on that vibe. I, I'd love to get my hands on that tape. It's it's gotta be somewhere um, <laughs> to see what that thing looks like. But yeah, so then we, so, you know, we get on this show, right? We win this friggin' show, right? And and I was just- Hold was, my beer, Alex. Yeah, it was just <laughs> awesome. Like, I mean, you're just like, are you joking with me? And um, yeah, the, the next stage of events, like I, you know, I started dating a girl from the show, moved to uh, LA and I'm there and I'm trying to figure out, I'm like doing casting for the show Blind Date. I don't know if you guys remember that show. And, oh, I do. And, yeah. And so like, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of picking up jobs and trying to figure out my way through this business. And ironically, two places called me their hometown kid, right? Georgetown, Boston area, right? And we were called on the show, the Boston Boys, right? In Jacksonville, Florida, because that's where I went to college, mm -hmm. right? 
So now I'm like, you know, trying to figure my way out in LA and I get a phone call, right? And there's a production company by the name of Pine Ridge Film and Television. The guy who owns that production company, a legend in the business named Jerry Smith. He like, he helped, like, I don't know if you remember, like Samantha Brown, great hotels. Like he was like the king of doing travel channel shows and discovery channel shows. He loved Jacksonville, Florida. Like he's like the only person that he was like making television out of Jacksonville, Florida of all places. <laughs> Cause he loved it. So it's very odd for that to happen. So I just get a phone call from a producer there saying, Hey Alex, like, because I'm the local kid, they're like, get him in here. Let's talk to him. And, you know, it turned, you know, and, and it wasn't like, Hey, here, start hosting shows. I mean, I got in there and he, I was selling stock footage, but like the second I met Jerry, we kind of connected and he's still like a second father to me and my mentor, you know, he's like 85 now. And he was like, I'm going to, I'm going to show you the ropes, bro. And he, um, you know, got, I started hosting shows for them and then started producing shows. So I spent about seven, eight years, like learning from one of the best and, you know, um, and so that, and that was, that was, that was a big, that was a big, like having someone, cause back in the nowadays, anyone can have a YouTube channel. Anyone can like create cast, you know, anyone can kind of like build their own self up. It wasn't like that back then. You really did have to get a break. Someone had to like, if you, just the editing equipment was like quarter million bucks to make a show. Like there was only a few players in the business. You didn't go now, from VHS tape to VHS tape and do like that trick where you oh, can kind of like maneuver it. Like, I, I was know like, you're better than that. Beta cams, you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah. is it on, so, so you were on beta, Ma were you on beta max or were you using well, VHS? Well, I, I think it was more like you... the beta, like I'm trying to think of what they used to film those big cameras. <laughs> I think that they call them beta tapes. I don't know what they. Yeah, no, I, I got in there probably about head first about high eight. <laughs> okay or is that hate? hate no hate they, they call it hate now it's like the no hate that's why i don't i can't convert any of those tapes it's no hate right on everyone's face yeah, it, it <laughs> sounds good <laughs> no, well, i got so many gigs on those things are you sure you're not drinking yeah, no. This is just usually a natural I don't, personality. We don't usually have to apologize till the second episode, but uh, <laughs> Alex, I just yeah, like yeah, to Benny, derail Benny, things. Benny, Benny never needs to apologize. <laughs> have you ever met me, dude? Like, know, this man. is my job is just to make everyone's job here harder. Totally, I love it. It's <laughs> great. It's great. And no one likes me online. They all say I should shut up, but they come. They keep coming back. <laughs> dude, you're great, dude. Did, did you guys it. subscribe? Keep by the way, everyone what, listening or watching, did you guys subscribe yet? Like, have I, we operatively I've conditioned you? I've been talking. Well, I've been doing this. So I'm in. <laughs> Good. All right, I'm going to ring the bell, and you guys are all going to drool. So it's good. Keep going, Siobhan. Tell us something useful and with meaning. I, I don't know. I was listening to this amazing story, and then something happened. You started well, talking, race. and it's just it's just out of my head now. <laughs> uh, well, so anyway, so I started working for this guy, and so I, I, I spent, like, uh, did At the Chef's Table, a number of different shows for them, Animal Attractions. And then and that's when someone says to me in Jacksonville, I'm living there. Someone's like, oh, it's easy for you to travel. You want amazing race. And that when someone when someone said this to me, whoever said it, it was it wasn't like a condescending way, but the way it was told to me, it bothered me. Like I was mm -hmm. just like, wait a second. I'm like, I think not money is a set, not having money is a sad excuse for not traveling. Like it's just not an excuse. Like you can travel on anything, like you know, you there, there's ways to get around this planet, right? If, if you want to. It's once again, it's a choice. So when that was said to me. I should find who that person was and, and give them some cash because it paid off because I was so upset that someone thought like, oh, that might have been me. I think, I think I said that. actually. <laughs> <laughs> someone, because someone, when someone said this to me, I was like, oh man, like they, they think I'm only doing this because I want an amazing race. Like that's the only reason why I had to travel. Like I I lived in Brazil. I, I'd done all this stuff beforehand. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, I looked and I was like, dude, I'd make it around the world if I had no money. And I remember saying that, and that was the beginning of around the world for free. And that mm -hmm. like, I'm talking about like a, like, um, you know, you know when you get those ideas. I'm sure you guys like get it when, when you're Doc writing Brown a song. Hit, hit, hit his head in the bathroom and came up with the flux capacitor. Exactly. <laughs> it, or you know what it is? It's like when something is drills a hole in your brain, you have to do it. You yeah, know what like I mean? one like, flew over the cuckoo's nest. Exactly. Perfect. So you have to do it, right? Like you have to. So like I literally, so, and I remember talking to Jerry and the team there and be like, hey, I got this idea. We're going to do the whole thing online. It's going to be like done daily and people are going to write in and they, you know, imagine it just wasn't their cup of tea. They're like, wait, what? Like, what do you, this sounds nuts, right? And they're like, you know, we're going to go make a show. And it's going to be 10 episodes. It's going to go to, like, that was their standard. So I remember talking about it. It just wasn't, and it was just time. So I'm like 28 at this time with the idea of around the world, knowing that it's time to time to kind of move on, to go back to LA and in the next stage, I just, I just felt it once again, it was a feeling. It was like, it was time to go. And so I, um, I got there and then a good buddy of mine who had a very similar kind of journey, Burton Roberts, 
who was a survivor Love guy. Burton's Love a man, Burton. right? So Burton is a, uh, he was on Survivor, right? like, you know, season three or something like that. And we became friends, like all the, the old school reality from CBS, like Big Brother, Survivor, Amazing Race. Like, and mm -hmm. there wasn't that many shows back then. So you all knew each other in LA. Like you all hung out together. Everyone kind of knew each other. And so Burton and I would just get like, we'd go out and just drink a lot of tequila together. <laughs> and we would share war stories. I've, and, I've witnessed that actually. Oh, oh yeah. You've probably been, uh, you know, yeah, it, it can get dangerous. And so we, we would sit back and, um, I just was impressed with what he did because he came off so very similar. He's like Kellogg MBA, like super smart guy, very successful in the corporate world, gets on Survivor and is like, forget it. I'm going this direction. And I, there's a lot of people who say they have passion. They say they want to do something. Burton actually like took an idea and, um, and took a bunch of reality people up to Big Bear, but created a show and sold it to Fox Reality. And I remember being like, super impressed because i'm in this circle of reality people where most people are just like having fun and yeah they're kind of dabbling i'd already spent like seven years like in the trenches like building so i i didn't want to i wanted to be a social i loved everyone but at the same time i'm like i'm at a different level like i'm i'm like in this yeah. business working burton was another one like that and so and, and he just was awesome and so literally one day we, over tequila we we're like we should just join forces we're both kind of on our own trying to do our own thing and put all these ideas in a hat and around the world for free just, you know, became like, let's just focus on this. And once again, that, you know, it, it, that took about a year, a year to get off the ground. Like, I mean, we pitched that everywhere. If I told you the amount of no's and like, you're crazy, you can't do it from even CBS who ended up being like the person who eventually bought the program from me. Um, we just heard no, 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 no. And then there was a, um, let me know when you ever want to stop, but like, I'll just keep rolling. No, <laughs> well, no, no, no just, please, this is great. This is great. No, keep going. This is no, great. No, this is always a segue to yes. Okay, so, okay. I mean, the perseverance is good. My question is, how much tequila did it require in, in, in the intermediate time in between, you know, coming up with the idea, the inception, and then actually hearing the word yes? How much so, was consumed by was it Iron Maiden level? Was it yeah. Motley Crue level? Because I mean, I know I've seen you Dude, guys. We're in, out, we're in our twenties, living in Hollywood. How Dude, much I was you with think? you guys it's in your thirties in Quincy, <laughs> and I couldn't. I'm like my my liver hurts thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, I I, I do think back to like my twenties, like late twenties to like mid thirties. I mean, like we did a lot of stuff drunk. You know what I mean? Like we were having a, I mean, we got a lot of stuff accomplished and we were out like four or five nights. It's amazing when you think back of what the body, Yeah. You, know, you guys, you guys are all like, you guys are on another level. You guys are banned. So like, but for me, I remember, and, and Burton's got like that, just like bottomless pit. So like, I just, I don't know how we were pulling off what we were doing, but anyway, so we, everyone had said no. A couple of people, this guy named, by the name of Gen Maynard, he's, he's the producer inside CBS who's credited with bringing Survivor, Amazing Race and these big franchises. And got a meeting with him, knew him. And I and he gave me like a good shot in the arm. Like he was like, listen, this reminds me of my early days with Survivor, right? Where no one wanted Survivor. Um, he goes, So here's the deal. My answer is no, <laughs> but I <laughs> but go for it. And and I even for a young kid who's got an idea, like that, what that meant to me, right? And that that gave that just kept like a little bit of like kind of like, it wasn't a, yeah, it was, it was an absolute no, but it was like enough for like, you got a good idea, but we were, um, there's a, there's a woman by the name of Anne O'Grady and I, I, another person like a Jerry Smith, who's hugely influential in my life and did a lot to make things work. And Burton and I, she was, she was, uh, VP of marketing at CBS. We're in New York city. She agrees to meet with Burton and I, right. We sit down like Burton and I are like, you know, we're, we're all ready for like this pitch. So we get in, we get into her and she's like, hey guys, like, you're not pitching me, are you? And, oh, no. I, and, we're, and we're like, <laughs> um, and I was like, well, we're going to, she's like, uh, I can't take a pitch guys. Like I'm marketing. Like you have to go through development. And I'm and like, oh man. <laughs> and so I kind of like, like, and she was like, well, let me see what you got, you know? <laughs> and so it's old school. Yeah. You know, we, we put in the DVD and we cut this little trailer and she's like, why isn't CBS doing this? Mm -hmm. she, and I was like, oh my gosh, we pitched everyone at CBS. No one will do it. And she's like, what do you want? And Bert and I are like, listen, can we get the CBS early show to follow us? Like we, and so we were off the idea of someone buying and paying for this. We're on to like, can we at least get some, get some people behind us? Like something to get this thing going. And she's like, let me get you a meeting with C the CBS early show. 
So Bert and I go back to LA. It's like a week or very quick, like within a week or two, this meeting gets set. Bert and I come back in. And this is why I give this, like, I mean, she's like one of my best friends now, but like, so she walks us into this meeting. It's old school CBS. You know what I mean? It's, it's like the guy smoking the stogie. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's like, you know, an old timer running it. And I remember he's like, what do you got kids? You know what I mean? Kind of thing. And so we go through the whole pitch. I'm like, listen, I'm going to leave. I'm going to have no money. And we're going to, people are going to like write into me where to go and we'll shoot it and we'll edit it every day. And he's like, uh, so what do you want? And I was like, can we, can we, can we launch live from the show? And will you follow me every week? Like just do a little segment. And he's like, I just remember, he's like, never a stunt. I don't like you got it. <laughs> and that was like, that was a big, like Bert and I were like, we thought we loved the lottery. You know yeah. Right? <laughs> so yeah, it was pretty cool. So that, and that was the beginning. So just that alone, Burton and I, you know, self-funded the project, got behind it. And, um, and, 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 and the project worked, it was working, right? Like it was so, it was super fun. And, and, um, I remember I, you know, you know, I travel all over, but I'm, I'm now went through the Caribbean. I'm in, I'm in like Chile uh, or, or South America. And I remember getting a call from a friend of mine who's a producer on the Wait Rachel a minute, Rich. isn't Chile in South America? Chile is in South America. So it wouldn't be an or situation, would it? Peru or Chile, right? Thank you. Yeah. I was Peru confused. I was trying to follow it. I was, I'm, I'm literally what, writing down. You, you can't event, see. Uh, Such an insignificant detail. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't know if it was. <laughs> All right, go on, go on. All right, so you're in South America. And, and, then, and this is where I knew that like we really had something. Because at this point, it's still our own money. It's cool. That, it's a cool project, but there's no, we're not making any money. We're like losing. Kind of like we Lost get, Symphony, our sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dot com. LostSymphony.com. So Chapter buy our three records so we don't go bankrupt. Yeah, please, because we have to do this. <laughs> this is so horrible talking to the guy doing way more fun things than us. So I guess it's just relative, right? Because you guys are like working, doing hard jobs. Alex is in fucking Mexico at the like the best five villas. <laughs> and then we're somewhere in between where we're like not doing real things, but like we're still like, it's not, it's not, it's not what you're doing. But, you could have okay. said that in like 50 less words than you did, but that's fine. Well, that's why Corey <laughs> so. can edit so well. <laughs> Sorry, it's awesome. Alex, continue. No, 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 no. Like, so, all right, so where are we at? Okay, so we're down there, and then there's a good buddy of mine, this guy Shane Farley, is, is an executive producer of the Rachel Ray Show, and I remember getting a call from him, and he calls, and he's like, Alex, we want you to do the exact same thing you're doing for Around the World for free, but do it for the Rachel Ray Show. We're going to create this whole thing called Rach the Rescue and blah, blah, blah. So that was the first one, like, oh man, like people are going to pay us to do stuff. <laughs> like, this is awesome. So that was like a big shot in the arm. And then like um, Burton was uh, at his college doing something and, the, and the, the president of WGN America, the station on Chicago, he sees this and they were like, hey, can you repackage this for TV? And that was, you know, we, we had, we had you know, some really good people that like, who had our back. So A, they bought the show. At like a really good rate. So now Bert and I are like, oh my gosh, we're like making money. Like this is awesome. And another little fun inside story of this first kind of project. There is, you know, well, you guys know rights very well, right? So it's like you sell typically certain certain types of rights. So we're in this meeting. We're WGN America, gentleman by the name of Ed Wilson's running the network. He's like, here's the deal. Guys, I'm super pumped. I hope this helps. Like he's he's like really good guy. So we're in this meeting, Bert and I are super excited. He's like, he goes, guys, I don't know if you guys saw this, but I'm giving you guys the international rights. So go do something with that. And Bert and I are kind of like, uh, well, well, sounds good. Like, what do we do? <laughs> he, goes, he goes, you guys don't have like an international distributor. Imagine we're like kids, like figuring this thing out. And he's like, hang on a second. And he, and he picks up the phone and I'll, there's a company called Reveille, biggest like international <laughs> distribution television shows. And he picks up the phone and gets a voicemail. And he's like, um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Anyway, he's like, hey, you got five minutes to call me back with the deals off the table. Like, this is like old school stuff. <laughs> hangs the phone up. And he's, he's kind of like laughing. He's like, he's like, looks at us, you know, and he's like, uh, just, just wait. Three minutes later, phone rings back. And he's like, all right, listen, I'm not telling you the idea of the show, but here's the deal. You're going to buy it. You're giving these guys 60% of the cut. You're not raping over the coals. This is what cuts the whole deal for us without <laughs> even telling them the show. And he's like, deal. And the guy's like, deal. He's like, you're buying around the world for free. The, sh the show. And then they showed the show to hundred countries around the world. So like <laughs> Burton and I were like, you know, had really good people. You yeah. Know, Wait a minute. Hold on. These. Did you Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, like the guy himself, you're like, so you come in there like, like white man can't jump where you're like, oh yeah, pick out any guy. And you got like your Woody Harrelson over there. And then, and the guy's like, oh, you don't know what, what, what the international rights are? Like hold my beer. And then yeah. you make this guy do like his whole shtick 
just to like show you his bravado and yeah, then right. yeah. get you guys in a hundred countries <laughs> yeah yeah and so, like, just that, because you're fun- pretending to be naive but were you naive or 100 just- percent? like I, I mean i'm not saying that this but i might know a little bit but not enough like i definitely didn't be like i got it someone on speed dial the call and go so much like any reputable company yeah. that's going to really move the needle on a show no that's I don't like have the-, the uh it's the opposite of what you usually you usually hear horror stories where you know the the naive person goes in the office and, and the big wig yeah. basically screws them over and, and you know with a smile uh, so that's you guys get yeah, really and, and you know lucky. You know what's funny about that? Like I always say, like I have been extremely blessed in my career, and I don't make any bones about it. Like I'm extremely blessed, and I don't have horror stories. Like I don't know if it's I'm a pretty I'm a good guy. I don't screw people over. I never have whatever like everything that's happened to me. Like I pay that thing forward ten times over. But like I just I don't know. Like everyone who's come in my path through this business has been awesome and genuine and wants to help. And like, so That's great. I've been, I've been really blessed and fortunate in that aspect. I, there's like, I always say like, there's all the pieces to this puzzle of life that you look at. There's so many people to thank and give gratitude to because there's, you just can't, there's no way anyone can make it through this world without help, without guidance. Right. And so. Yeah, that's a powerful statement. Absolutely. We, we always say that energy transfers and it's kind of like the energy yeah. that you project. So, you know, like, dude, you're like a happy go lucky, just smiling. Like, I'm just going to get out of the beach and make <laughs> make drinks for everybody. And we're just going to get around and you're just going to like me. And, and But the thing is, is this is how you are. Yeah. Like, I've hung out with you. You've been nice to me since day one like you're like the first thing you're like, hey, how are you, man? Here's a drink. Like, I'm Alex. Like, What's going on? Like, and you've all it's you've always given me great advice like every time because i've been called to be on television shows i've been floating around and all sorts of stuff and alex and and i just so everyone understands i met alex because my friend brian pitcher who they both know (laughs) tried out for survivor 16 times because he's a goddamn (laughs) maniac (laughs) i didn't even know and he became apparently so in with burton and alex that like he somehow conned them, conned these guys <laughs> into coming out to Boston to like film a pilot episode of a show that never really happened. But since then, we've been friends. And I, I have to tell you, and I'm a little- is a great guy. He's awesome. No, I love Brian. I love Brian. <laughs> and he's one of my best friends in the entire world. But I'm saying I was a little distressed when he first off told me to cancel my date and go to New York randomly and then says at like four o'clock in the morning, we have to go down to the early show. You couldn't pick to like the middle of the day show like to launch yeah. your show because I showed up to New York one morning for when they launched Jeff around the world for free. And actually you guys, you and Burton symbolically gave your backpack that you guys had taken. You had circumvent, uh, you'd, you'd gone around the entire globe and you passed it on to Jeff on uh, to, it, with Julie from the early show. And I, I'm there in the background with like my hat I got for free. Oh, yeah, <laughs> with Brian Pitcher. But then we ended up taking um, Jeff uh, to Boston. And we went to Gloucester, which is not too far from Georgetown. Yeah, it was a great. And, it was like that was the big. You guys kicked the whole thing off. Well, let me two. ask you this: What what did you think about him walking the greasy pole? Because that people good, that don't that don't know Gloucester, okay, like you cannot be a fisherman, and that's like a, like a generations old fisher town, like fisherman town, like lobster, like the best lobster in the world, like there in Gloucester sure. in Gloucester Massachusetts but you have to like pay patronage to San Pedro okay is that is, is that what it is I what? will say I would say this much that was such a kind of popular scene I think in every one of Fiesta. the promos that was ever cut you see Jeff walking and jumping off the greasy pole like that was an every trailer every promo like that was, I think that was part of like the show open because it was so <laughs> powerful. So thank you, man. Well, good choice, and man. also Jeff was in good shape, so it helps. <laughs> yeah, Jeff's a good looking guy. Beefcake. This, this is a uh, it's a good good place to break. We're coming up at the end of the uh, hour one here, Ben. That was very temperate, Corey. <laughs> Don't you he's want to leave some suspense? He's, he's furiously taking notes of all the things he has to edit out that you said. So <laughs> right. don't give him such a hard time. I usually just delete his audio track, anyways. <laughs> I do see myself sometimes like. <laughs> no, so you want to wrap but, it up, Ben or Corey? Yeah. No, I was just gonna say so. So so thank you so much, Alex. Uh, I feel like we got through a lot. <laughs> That was yeah. A, that was a lot of uh, information in there. That Again, was, a great storyteller. Yeah. So yeah, some yeah. soccer. Yeah, 
Tom, uh, Tom, uh, uh, Tom Cruise on the beach making drinks, <laughs> going around the world, winning, winning 300000 after taxes, <laughs> going, like, f- saying, fuck Germany, take my job and shove it, coming back to play some soccer. No dice on that, driving to the coast, making a vow to his friend. I'll be back. I'll be back <laughs> for your graduation. <laughs> going down to St. Bart's, which, by the way, you can't just get St. No, John. St. John. St. John. So you have to go to St. Bart's, and then you have to go over some Barry and then go to sit and then he he's there for five minutes goes to Woody's because it just says outside simple advertisement this is the best place in the Caribbean for happy hour and then says do you need a uh, can you hire me next day has a job 15 grand in the bank goes back good memory I was gonna say finishes on 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 his vow to his friend to see him graduate because he's a hyper genius this guy he's gonna do wonderful things for the world no one's gonna listen to the episode they're gonna fast forward to the end and listen to this giant rant okay well you've been 20 2020 stay here for part two later this week bye if you give Martin Scorsese all of his pills and his like m- Sunday through Saturday little pill bottle thing and make sure that he's all right no that okay. that would be Scorsese's assistant <laughs> what I do as an assistant director is that I uh, make I facilitate all the filming of the picture so that everything gets done so you're much more important than making sure he's on his antipsychotics yes I okay. could however go to his assistant and say Make sure he's on his anti-product. <laughs> <laughs>